everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Jen Bolin, founder and owner of Bolin Solutions. We're going to get into something called incremental testing. <laughs> Jen, are you ready to take me to school on this? I sure I am. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, Jen, I love anything that says elevating your nonprofit's reach because that's what, at the end of the day, we're all trying to do that to funders, donors, clients, you know, our community, our constituency. It's such an interesting concept to be latching onto. And um, especially as we start a new month, we move into Q4. I just feel like this is an amazing amazing conversation so we're really thrilled you're here another thing that we're thrilled about having is here is our 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 partners Woo, say that fast three times they include bloomerang american nonprofit academy staffing boutique nonprofit thought leader fundraisers friday our new episode on fridays just dedicated to fundraising and your part-time controller we have this uh, amazing group of co-hosts they come from all over the country they're incredibly diverse in the where they work, where they live, uh, the, the, the parts of the nonprofit sector they serve. And so um, I hope you've been able to get to meet them uh, over the past couple months. Okay, back to you, woman of the hour, Jen Bolin, Bolin Solutions. Where are you coming to us from? I am coming from Atlantic Beach, Florida, just outside of Jacksonville. Wow, okay. Talk to me about what Bolin Solutions does. Sure. So I am focused on helping people get more out of their data. Um, I was in the agency world for more than a decade. And over and over and over again, I saw that we were collecting all of this data, but we weren't getting the right things out of it. And so I actually have two focuses of my practice. Um, content analytics, which I'm not talking about here today, and fundraising analytics. And so from the fundraising analytics side of things, um, I really wanted to focus on helping clients understand how to interpret their data and how to better measure their fundraising. Um, because I'm seeing a lot of organizations overvaluing um, channels that really are demand capture channels and not demand generation channels. And as a result, um, probably over-investing in the wrong tactics and under-investing in the right tactics. Okay, holy moly, I'm gonna call this a hair on fire moment. I can tell I'm gonna need to spend the day with you and not just 30 minutes because um, everything is being pushed. Collect, 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 get data, get data, get data. You know, if you don't have metrics, you're nothing. And then, I love what you just said, you know, like, okay, you do this, but what do you do with it? Right. And mm -hmm. fascinating. This is going to be a really powerful conversation. And um, I'm going to probably have to stop you several times and ask you to drill down questions or explain things. So <laughs> I'm really excited to, to have this conversation. So let's start off with the beats model. What the heck is this? Yeah, so it's a framework that I've taken actually from the for-profit world okay. um, because they uh, do tend to lead um, with a lot of the technology and the thoughts and the ideas. And so BEAT stands for business financials, which for nonprofits, I also say you can call it the bottom line, but this is you know, the revenue that you can count on the bank. This is the money that you're spending. Um, and everybody knows these are the right numbers and there's no question over how much money you raised and how much money you spent to raise that money. And then there's experiments. And this is the big piece of what this talk is gonna be about is using experiments, testing, lift testing, to understand the incrementality of your marketing so that you can better understand where you should be putting your dollars. Mm -hmm. And then there's analytics. And so, Man, one of the really great things is, is we've been able to do so much more with less um, because of um, yeah. 
technology now and data is easier and easier and it's only going to get easier to analyze. And so it's really about thinking beyond just like reporting, but like understanding um, regression analysis and diminishing returns. We're really trying to understand how your spend is generating your revenue. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do uh, with analytics. I could have a whole uh, hour plus on that. Um, and then technology. Mm -hmm. A lot of this isn't possible without technology. And mm -hmm. so making sure that we are, you know, leveraging technology, a lot of inexpensive and or free technologies. And then the last thing is surveys. Um, Surveys allow us to sort of triangulate our way to the truth. And while we don't want to take every word that a donor says, like how they heard about you, um, complete and utter, um, you know, like, like, you know, we don't want to fully take their word for it. But what we want to do is see that data against how they actually maybe came to the website. So we can start to understand, oh, you know what? They said that they uh, read about us in a newspaper and then they came to the site via a branded paid search ad and helping us see some of those connections so that we know that we're investing in the right channels. Wow. OK, so I'm just going to call it out. This seems like a heavy lift for most organizations to do by themselves and do it internally. Is this the sort of thing that you need to find a, a partner, or, you know, consultant, an expert to help you manage this and that you need to come to the table educated so you can understand what's going on? Or is this something that an organization could actually attempt to do themselves? If you can use Excel, you can do this yourself. OK, wow. Another <laughs> here on fire moment. OK, good. Well, then. <laughs> then we need to keep we need to keep drilling down because I think this is absolutely fascinating. So then let's talk about incremental and lift testing. Yeah. So this is really the gold standard okay. of understanding how well our marketing is working. If we don't do withholding tests, if we don't test into higher spend, if we don't test into different types of creative we will never know the true incrementality of our marketing efforts. And so one of the things is, is that so many organizations, particularly those that are doing digital, rely upon last click attribution and rely upon view through attribution. But the problem is, is that neither one of those tells you the incrementality. In fact, um, earlier this year, MNR put out their benchmark report, and um, one of the things that it showed was, you know, the percent of revenue spent on the various channels by small, medium, and large organizations. And I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but if I recall correctly, most small nonprofits were spending about fifty percent of their marketing budget on paid search, mm. and then most. Uh, medium-sized nonprofits were closer to like 35, 36% um, on paid search. And one of my biggest, I'm going to just go ahead and call it a pet peeve, is how much money our nonprofits are spending on um, branded paid search, which is really a demand capture tactic, where mm -hmm. in most cases, if they didn't spend that money, that revenue would fall to their organic search listing in on the search engine results page. And so one of the first things that I recommend that nonprofits test, and there's two key factors here, is one is, do you rank for your name when somebody searches for it? And on occasion, there are nonprofits that don't or can't because of various reasons. And for them, a branded campaign does make sense. Right. Um, or two, is somebody else bidding on your name? And I do see this um, in some of the more competitive um, nonprofits, like in the health industry and so forth, bidding on each other's names, in which case you may need to continue to bid on your name to maintain that top market share. Mm -hmm. But if those two things do not apply to you, mm -hmm. and particularly if you're a larger national organization, 
I recommend doing a withhold test where you take one market and you don't run those branded paid search ads. And then you turn them off for probably a month, um, okay. six weeks. And then you look at your results. So basically what you do is you've established your baseline of like how much revenue you would expect to raise um, based on like the prior year likely in a particular set of zip codes. And then you turn off Google because you can do that. And then, you know, obviously you're still going to raise money in that particular zip code because people are going to find your site other ways. They're going to come in via Facebook and some of the other ways that you're advertising. But then look and see, did turning off that ad actually reduce the revenue? And so running these tests enables us to really see the value, not that last click value that Google is telling you, and particularly Google Analytics. Like this is, again, one of my biggest pet peeves. If you're using Google Analytics to measure your marketing, Google is going to try to claim credit for every single thing that they can. That is what the tool is meant to do. It's great for behavioral analysis. I recommend clients use it for behavioral analysis, but... I do recommend that you don't take that last click or even their quote unquote, you know, linear, um, well, now it's a black box model, um, too seriously, that you need to be doing the incrementality testing to be able to understand. Well, you know, it, it's fascinating when you go on to, you know, search a nonprofit and you type their name in fully and then that paid search comes up and then their unpaid search is right is number two or right under it and right. you know you can, you can identify right then and there wow they're spending money when automatically they they came to the top so i mean it's a fascinating thing that you're talking about it and you're saying three to six weeks in that elimination test like, yeah, four to six weeks. Four to six um, weeks. Yeah. And it's going to depend a little bit on how many uh, gifts you get in a given month. Mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't do it in a super low um, giving month, but mm -hmm. you could certainly run this test, let's just say, starting in mid-September through mid-October mm -hmm. so that you're prepped to understand um, whether or not, you know, you need to be running this. And I think the biggest benefit is, is then taking those dollars that you saved and being able to shift it to a more performative channel. That is, to me, the biggest, you know, like benefit of doing this kind of work. Right. You're not just stripping that out of your budget. You're actually reevaluating it and then assigning it to something that's going to have even more impact, which at the end of the day is what we're looking for. So. Okay, now let's talk about lift testing. So um, lift testing is similar in the sense that what we're trying to do is understand maybe the creative lift from a particular type of creative, okay. or it can also be done um, with the channel. And so again, what we're doing is, is we're creating, um, I mean, we have to do one of two things. Like I said, it is a lot easier for larger nonprofits that run in bigger geographic areas because they can just withhold from a single area versus needing to withhold in total. Um, it can be a little bit less scary to do it that way. Um, but what we want to then do is we want to understand how what percent of lift did we get but then we want to multiply that times the average gift. And we want to understand either oh. um, that, you know, okay, so we've withheld this particular um, channel or this particular creative. And then we want to see what percentage increase or decrease did that generate. And then we want to take that and multiply it times an average gift to get, you know, a true estimated revenue amount and then compare that to either what was expected to be raised or what um, we would, um, what was either expected to be raised or what we, what we gained. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting thing because I would imagine, and I love your feedback on this, 
I would imagine if you worked with clients or an organization and you said, what do you think will be the result when we do this testing? And people are probably, especially in Marcom's marketing communication departments and then development directors, probably feel like they know and they have a pretty systematic response. And I would imagine that when this data comes back, there are a lot of people that are like, holy moly, I missed this. Is that true or, or not? It is. It is because of this last click attribution method. Um, I, I, you know, I was working with a client and I'm moving them on to measuring via the beats model, but obviously for historical reasons, they still need to report out on that last click method just to keep mm -hmm. stakeholders happy. And so we were looking at that data and this was di a digital only client of mine. And one of the things that we saw in the last click data is, you know, direct website hero light box. They're getting, I think it was getting 76% of the credit for, for the revenue. And we know that every single one of those visits, a light box does not drive a donation. Somebody still had to get to the site. It may help you improve the lift of how many donations you get. Another example of doing a test, um, a little bit easier to A-B test something like that on your website. Um, but that light box did not bring that user to the site. They happened to see it. And hopefully, you know, for whatever reason that was compelling, they clicked on it and they made a gift, but it didn't actually cause the gift, nor did clicking on the donate button cause the gift, right? Like, yeah. so Good really point. encouraging folks to stop looking at their data that way, um, because it is probably leading them to put their dollars in the wrong places. Wow. This is fascinating because so much of what you're talking about involves a whole new approach to even thinking about this. Um, and so let's talk about this. Like, how do we design these tests and how do we navigate this? I mean, for so many people, just reading that Google Analytics is like a major step up. I'm not going to lie. I mean, right? It seems so efficient and so like there's somewhat confounding if you don't know what you're looking at and then there's interpretation. Um, so how do we go about this? Um, well, you know, the one thing that I, again, I recommend that most everybody start with that paid search since so many um, smaller nonprofits, I think probably overspend on paid search. I would venture to guess that almost every single nonprofit out there does not need to be spending that money. Um, and then what I would really do is, I mean, you need to kind of think holistically about your user journey, right? Like you need to be thinking about all of those touch points from those awareness touch points, from those branding touch points, um, all the way down to, you know, those, what I call demand capture touch points, which, you know, it's largely direct traffic, organic branded search and then paid branded search right like again those are just capturing the clicks those aren't generating the clicks so we want to really understand what is generating um our search so whether or not you know i think what's really hard is everyone is scared to do a withhold test and it can be scary um but i just I want people to sort of realize that maybe your revenue is a little soft that month and it really shouldn't be much, especially if your organic listing is already picking up that paid listing. Right. Like right. I would venture to guess that if I had a hundred clients run this test, 99 of them, 99 of them would not see any change in their revenue from withholding that branded paid search. Um, now, wow. Probably, you know, want to make sure that your organic listing has had like a little bit of SEO. So maybe look at your title of that page and the meta description just to make sure you're putting your best foot forward um, on those paid search ads. Um, but I mean, yeah. And then the other thing is, is just to look at geographic areas or to test into new channels. And when you test into new channels, Think about looking at, um, 
your overall, and this is kind of where the B and the beats model comes into impact or into play is as you spend more and as you, as your revenue increases, there's a correlation between those two numbers called the Pearson's uh, squared. And then when you uh, basically look at your revenue and then your ad spend and you correlate the two of them, if that number is reaching one, that means every additional dollar you're spending is actually not driving more incremental revenue. And so it's wow. an indicator that you may be reaching those diminishing returns. And so paying attention to that number as you test into channels, as you test creative um, is, is really important. But again, it comes back to always looking at that bottom line number. The times we want to use a view through conversion are when we're comparing two pieces of creative, in which, pay, in which case we might want to look at the view through data of the cost, obviously the impressions, and then our revenue um, per dollar raised to say, okay, did campaign or creative A raise more money than creative B? So we're testing apples to apples in the sense that we know one is more effective than the other, but we're not necessarily saying, oh, based on view through conversions, um, this user, or sorry, you know, this ad definitely generated X dollars. Right. Another right. place where I see that waste is actually in remarketing um, because it's so easy to track those view through conversions. Those remarketing campaigns look really, really effective. But if okay, you again, I'm, I'm going to stop you. Explain to me what remarketing is because yeah. I don't know so, what that is. Yeah. So remarketing is when somebody visits your website and or your donation form and then you have a campaign that then shows them ads based on oh. having visited that page and or your website. OK. And so, okay. yeah, yeah, those ads look extremely effective because a lot of those folks would have given anyways. And to be honest with you, I'm still looking for a volunteer client to test uh, out of uh, the, out of remarketing because I do think it's a waste, but there have been studies in the for-profit sector over and over and over again, showing that when you pull those ads out of market, there is almost no loss in revenue. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe we lose a little here, but if we're reapportioning that yeah. to somewhere else that has more impact, we're mm -hmm. collecting it right. in another place. So I can tell you as a consumer, when that happens to me, and I and I'm and I'm I, I use the word targeted, but mm -hmm. use your vocabulary, remarketed too, it kind of torques me out because I feel like I'm being manipulated. Um, and I don't think that I'm just like, oh wow, what are the odds? Look at this ad showed up. Yeah. I mean. Right. I feel like we're along enough in um, technological society to realize that this is, you know, a, a directed way of marketing. And so it seems to me like there's going to be a lot of resistance um, and especially in the nonprofit sector. And again, I have no data based on this uh, other than my own personal feeling. But I feel like sometimes it seems like, wow, that's just a little too sexy for that nonprofit. It's just a little too um, expensive and diabolical. I'm going to go ahead and use that word, right? <laughs> As opposed to, oh, thank you for reminding me. I wanted to donate to you. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it seems to me like that would be a little bit of a hard sell. Um, when, when I mean, a lot of nonprofits do spend a good portion of their budget on remarketing ads. So it's yeah. it's it's something I see over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know how effective uh, those conversion pixels maybe aren't because then you donate and you still continue to see the ad. And let's be honest, we know very few people donate multiple times in a month. Yeah, um, it is rare. And so um, if those ads worked a little bit better and those, uh, you know, conversion pixels fired properly, which, you know, by the way, it's a whole nother topic um, is, you know, the loss of those third party cookies and how that impacts 
both targeting as well as some of our measurement. Um, and so again, the BEATS model doesn't need any of that to be able to effectively measure this lift, the bottom line, and making sure that as we're spending more, we're making more, and we're making more in proportion to what we're spending. Right. You know, this has been absolutely fascinating. And um, I I'm thrilled that you're out there in our sector helping us to understand this. Let me drill down a little bit in the, the last few minutes that we have with you. What size budget of an organization should be looking at this? I mean, if you're under a million dollars, is this going to be something that's just too aggressive for you? Do you need to get to a certain threshold? Do you need to be, have a certain number of donors? I mean, what are you looking at so that you can get a good capture of, of the ecosystem? I mean, I think if you're raising less than a million dollars, you at a bare minimum need to know what is referred to as the marketing efficiency ratio. And that is literally, and it's, it can also be expressed as cost per dollar raise, but it is looking unsiloed at your data. And this includes direct mail and digital if you're doing both, because I think a lot of folks underestimate how much direct mail actually drives digital. Like people are writing fewer and fewer checks. And so these people are coming to your site, even though they received a piece of direct mail. Yeah. So making sure that you know the total amount that you raised and the total amount that you spent on fundraising and that you're dividing those two and you have that number. That is your, that's like, you know, the cost per dollar raise, that's your marketing efficiency ratio so that you know that number. Similarly for uh, all your new donors. So you want to make sure that every month you're looking at how much money in total did I spend? And then how much did it cost me to acquire a new donor? Now, if you want, you can remove your direct mail appeals since we know that those aren't going to, um, you know, to prospects or people on your acquisition list. Right. Um, so that that is that is OK to remove that. But what we want to understand is what does it cost holistically to bring a new donor onto the file, whether it's digital or direct mail or really that blended number, since we know those things work together. Wow. And then amazing. If you can take it just one more step, mm -hmm. you take both those two numbers, the cost per dollar raise or the marketing efficiency ratio. Sorry, I've been reading a lot in the for-profit world to apply some of these uh, tactics to our world. Um, and then your cost per new donor, which they call the CAC in the for-profit world. Mm -hmm. And you want to actually correlate that with what you're spending. And again, this is where you want that number to be less than one, because if that number is in excess of one, then it's it's probable that you're starting to that you're overspending and then that's where the incrementality test can start to come into play where you start to think about okay what channels may not be contributing to my bottom line and starting to figure that out amazing wow this has been just fascinating and um again we need more time with you because these are things that um a lot of times we know maybe that things aren't the way they seem, but we just don't know how to get there, right? We just don't know how to articulate it. We don't know how to operate it. Um, and then to even understand the data. You started out this conversation this morning, Jen, about just understanding the data and looking at the metrics and saying, okay, yeah, you have this information, but what does it mean? You know, the old adage of when, you know, you start programming garbage in, garbage out. If you're not looking at at the correct things and understanding what those parameters are in some ways it's more poisonous you're going to be making bad decisions right and uh so this has been fascinating jen boland uh, founder and owner of boland solutions check out boland b-o-l-a-n-d solutions s-o-l-u-t-i-o-n-s.com and then you can learn more about jen and her work and in her approach to this because this is really in my mind, Jen, where, where we need to be going as we are adopting this digital age and, and digital donor relationships, we've got to now start to understand this um, because it's, it's a very fragile situation. And, and I believe that we're making a lot of decisions um,
based on what we think or feel or believe and not really on the hard data. And so this has been just a really interesting way to look at this. I, I applaud your work and um, I wish I had your brain. <laughs> well, thank you. And just a quick plug, I do post a lot about this on LinkedIn. So um, feel free to just search for my name um, and follow me on LinkedIn because that's where I'm talking about uh, a lot of Beats model and incrementality uh, work that I'm doing. I love it. Yeah, I think that's how I found you. And um, I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, another thing that we want to make sure that we do before we say goodbye to Jen today is to thank our amazing presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out so we can get this amazing conversation like we've had with Jen Boland today. Um, Jen, you've really given me a lot to think about. I think it's going to help me understand more with some of your posts that you, you put up on LinkedIn to understand your framework better and to really look at this more holistically. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Hey, everybody, we end each and every episode with this message and it goes simply like this to stay well. So you can do well. Thanks, everyone. See you again.